Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blessed doctrines of grace that form the heart of your teaching in Scripture about salvation. Lord, we pray that you'll help us get it right and defend it and hold to it in our preaching and our teaching as we try to help others to understand the gospel of Christ. Bless this evening's study, we pray, as we think together about grace alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The five solas, or five statements, doctrinal statements in the uh, doctrines of grace, ideas as taught in Re Reformational thinking, are, uh, we're saved by grace alone, there's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as taught in the scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, scripture alone, and the glory of God alone. That formed the heartbeat of the Reformation of the 16th century. So tonight, beginning our five studies on these five solas, I want to talk to you about grace alone. Grace alone. And to do that, I want to read, I think, one of the most glorious passages of Scripture on the subject of grace alone from Ephesians chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I want to read a statement by Martin Luther in his book entitled Bondage of the Will, page 100. He says the following, <clears throat> I'm quoting him. God has surely promised his grace to the humble. And I think he had in mind there James 4, where the Bible says essentially that. And then he, he goes on, that is, those who mourn and despair over themselves. But, he continues, a man cannot thoroughly be humbled till he realizes that his salvation is utterly beyond his own powers, his own counsels, his own efforts, his own will, and his own works. And his salvation depends absolutely on the will of God, the counsel of God, the pleasure of God, and the work of God. It is God's alone. End of quote. I think that succinctly explains what grace is all about. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read verses 4 through 10 and, and harness verses 8 and 9 <clears throat> for our contemplation tonight. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4 begins, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It, the gift, the faith, is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I think it's fairly obvious Paul believed in salvation 
by grace alone, the grace of God. This former Pharisee who once kept the law because he thought the law was his righteousness before God came to realize that we are all, as he says in verse 5 of this reading, we're dead in our trespasses. We have trespassed against God. We have sinned against God. And we are dead. There's not a thing we can do about it. If you're dead, you can't do anything. But it was God who made us alive with Christ. It is God who by His grace saves us. It is God who raised us up <clears throat> with Christ and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. And then he goes on to explain about this grace, that it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And we'll think together about faith as the Lord wills next week. He says, this is not your doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. There are other passages of Scripture, I'll mention a few, that point to essentially the same idea. For example, Titus 3.5, in which Paul the Apostle writing to Titus says, referring to God, He saved us. Not because of our works. Romans 3.24, again, Paul's writing, we are, he writes there, justified by his grace as a gift. Romans 11 and verse 6. He argues what grace is by saying, if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, he says, grace would not be grace. That's exactly right. You can't have grace plus works or grace isn't. Grace, Romans 6, 23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And finally, 2 Timothy 1, 9. Speaking of God, he writes, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose. And grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You see there this sense of election and predestination. And when you, when you look at all that God does in salvation, from election before the foundation of the world, to the cross of Jesus Christ, to its application through the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us to conviction of sin, regeneration, and keep us saved and take us to glory. Every step of that process is by grace alone. It's all filled with the grace of God. I mentioned four ways that grace and grace alone is involved in our salvation. First, we think about God's <clears throat> salvific or saving initiative and accomplishment. God's salvific or saving initiative and accomplishment. The Bible teaches that it is always God who in saving sinners takes the initiative. It is never sinners pursuing God so that God would pursue them, but rather it is always God pursuing them that they might pursue God. It's always that way in Scripture. Before the foundation of the world, the Lord chose us in Christ. In our own salvation experience, mine and yours, we can't even take credit for that, can we? It isn't that we, we wanted God so much that God said, okay, I'll save you. You've earned the right to be saved. No. Salvation is not earning the right. It is God pursuing the person whom he has chosen unto salvation. As 
Acts 13 and verse 48 says, those were who were predestined to eternal life believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's accomplishment. God was accomplishing his salvation by grace on the cross of Jesus Christ. And God is accomplishing salvation in my life and yours by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life that he gives us in the Lord Jesus. Grace is seen in that initiative. Second, God's grace in saving us is seen in his elect, eternal, redemptive love that he put on us. Now, I would like to be able to say to you that God chose you to save you because you are all so beautiful. I'm not going to say any more about that. I would like to say to you, God, God chose to save you because you are all so smart and brilliant. Or I'd like to say to you, God chose to save you because he saw in you something worthwhile that he saw down the corridors of time that you would do something good, like believe on Jesus. So he chose you in view of that. But I tell you truthfully and forthrightly tonight that that's not why God chose you. When someone asks me, why did God choose me? The only answer I can come up with is because he wanted to. He, he chose us of his own free will to bring glory to his name. Listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. God had a plan, and that plan included loving us and, and sticking with us and saving us and holding us close to his own. God's grace is seen in God's choice of putting his redemptive eternal love on us. He chooses us because he wants to. He loves us because he chooses to love us. And as Romans 8 says, nothing in this world will ever stop God from loving his people whom he has chosen to love. That's grace. Third, we see the grace of God in the dispensation of the saving work of Christ on the cross, where he did the hard work of, of the atonement that he achieved there. There are a number of passages that come to mind that help me think about that and really call me to understand that the love of God expressed in the grace of God made the cross of Jesus Christ happened for my good. Listen to John 10, where Jesus says, and by the way, I'm in chapter 9, verse uh, Sunday morning, I hope to preach on verses 6 through 38. We'll see how that goes. But John 10 is around the corner. And I cannot wait to get to John 10. Listen to what Jesus says. As he uses the analogy of him being the good shepherd. Verses 14 and 15. Jesus says the following. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own know me. Just as the father knows me. He says in verse 15. I know the father. And then listen to what he says. I lay down my life. For the sheep. The question is posed twofold. Is there any way for God's people to be saved other than the cross of Jesus Christ? And that is answered in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus praying said to the Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But do you know why Jesus had to go to the cross and suffer, bleed, and die there? Because there was no other way. It was the grace of God that said, my son, it isn't because God the Father ceased to love God the Son. But he 
He chose to place His Son on the cross to accomplish His redemptive, eternal will in the salvation of His people. That's grace. Jesus said in answer to the question, for whom did I die or for whom did Jesus die? Well, there's a sense in which that we could say he died for the whole world, meaning there is no other way for anybody to be saved except through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not just Christians that are saved through the cross. There's no other way to be saved. But in another way, we could answer it by saying, he died effectually for those whom he came to save. Believers. His death on the cross was effectual only for those who would look to him. So it's a particular redemption and it's a particular atonement. He died for us. In the words of Jesus in John 10, I lay down my life for my sheep. Augustus' top lady in a, a song or hymn that he wrote says, just as God cannot twice demand, once at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. Once my sins were paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and in Christ's atoning work on the cross, I am declared justified and righteous and free. God can never now come back on me and say, pay for your sins. They're already paid for in the atoning work of Christ. That, my friend, is grace. It's grace in the dispensation of the saving work of Christ in the atonement. And number four, we see God's grace <clears throat> in the giving of new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said when he comes back, there'll be one taken and one left. All through human experience, it's an amazing mystery why some get it and some don't. Why some believe and some reject. Why some come to Christ and others refuse. Except to say this, the ones who come to Jesus Christ and say yes to Christ do so because the Holy Spirit does His saving work in our lives. And the Holy Spirit does that work because God's grace is sending the Spirit to make that work happen. How are we convicted of sin? It's by the grace of God. How are we born again? John chapter 3. You may remember that passage where Jesus talked about being born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. How is that so? He said, you must be born by the Spirit. By water and the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Grace empowers our wills to choose Christ. Some believe we reform people do not believe that we exercise our wills <clears throat> in coming to Christ. Oh, but, but we do believe that we exercise our wills. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, <clears throat> we say yes to Jesus Christ. But we know that the truth is we would never have willed to come to Christ until God makes us willing to come to Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is His credit that we even will to come to Christ. It's grace that enlivens our emotions to look to Christ in faith and love to see His beauty. That's grace in operation. Grace holds us and causes us to persevere through repentance, the maintenance of faith, and growth in godliness. How are we kept saved? Are we saved by grace and then we keep ourselves saved the rest of our time? No. Grace not only brings us to Christ, grace keeps us with Christ. It's by grace and grace alone. And what takes us to heaven at the end of our journey? I was talking to a brother just earlier this evening about insurance. Where's he going with that? And we were discussing, I don't want to put a downer on you, but um, as things are moving in these days, I think we're going to get to a point 
where very likely there's, there's going to be a severe rationing of health care. But when and if that time comes, may I give you a good word of encouragement? If, if they hasten my death or yours, as children of God, we have the last laugh. We're going to heaven. By grace and by grace alone. The day of our death is better than the day of our birth. Because going to heaven is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Or ever will happen to me. Grace is loving. Grace is merciful. Grace is powerful. Grace is salvific. Grace is to the glory of God alone. Grace alone. Now that may lead you to a question, and I'm going to close at this point because we're not done. I'm not done with grace. But we're certainly not done with the five souls. How, how do I engage with God's grace? Next week, we think together about faith alone. May God bless us as we do. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Your grace that is eternal. Your grace that engages our weakness and makes your power perfect in our human experience at the very point where we are the weakest. Thank you for your grace that that placed our sins upon Jesus on the cross. Thank you for that grace that forgives us of our sins because Jesus died for us. Thank you for that grace that sent the Holy Spirit to our hearts. Thank you for that grace that changed our minds, our hearts, our souls, gave us new birth. Thank you for the grace I've had today. Thank you for the grace I'll have tomorrow. And thank you for the grace that will meet me on my dying day and take me home to heaven. Thank you for your grace. Tonight we acknowledge as a church, it is not by works. It is not by earning a right standing before you by which we're saved. It is by your grace and grace alone. This month, we pray you'll help us to think rightly about the gospel of Christ in view of these five solas. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.